Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hartmut Meyer, and I have the easiest task at this conference. Because everything I have to say is in two pictures. This is one, where I've come to Oxford University. And the other image is what I see and you don't see. A room full of distinguished guests, full of committed academics, full of students, and full of members of the general public. And this gives me a particular moment of satisfaction because I know how much preparation, work, planning, thinking, a bit of panicking goes into organizing a conference of this magnitude and of this in terms of speakers and participants distinction. So I'm very glad to see this picture because it's all happening. So um, that is the easy <coughs> bit of my talk. And then to make it a bit more complicated, I went on page two of our program and I find logos. It says UPEP. UPEP is a new program based on an old program. I see the European Studies Center, I see CSOX, and I see the European. And somehow I have my finger in all these pies. I'm the director of the European Studies Center, director of the European, and therefore partly involved in these programs. So let me talk a little bit. You all know the European Studies Center because some of the guests have been regular guests. Some are new. Our students come regularly and you know what the European Studies Center does. It's an interdisciplinary study center looking at Europe from different disciplines. History, <coughs> philosophy, social policy, law, and obviously economics. And last night I had a dinner, one of those closed dinners, about Brexit and what really annoys me is everyone talks about Boris said this and Boris said that and this one said this but very few people who actually make decision have a deep understanding of the economic forces underlying the European politics and the European process. So that's why I'm so happy that we have UPEP, our program that actually studies economic issues, fiscal issues, monetary issues because if we don't understand that, um, we don't understand Europe. The program was based on a predecessor program, which was PEFM, but we have continuity and we want to preserve some of the achievements of PEFM in the new project that is um, continuity in themes and in analysis, but also in personnel. Charles, Daniel, Adrian, um, thank you for all your work for UPEF. We have also continuity because we have our very, very, very distinguished and successful CSOX program. Um, for almost 20 years studying um, Southeastern Europe and for at least 10 years if not longer there has always been a strong economic, fiscal and monetary component. The program has done research on the subject and some of the guests who are here today came um, to some of our CSOX programs. So I congratulate Othon, David, others who are involved um, with CSOX for that success. Um, <coughs> There's also the logo which says Europeum. Europeum is a network of 17 European universities and we're trying to create additional opportunities for students of the member universities. And I'm in particular delighted that we have chosen excellent students from our member universities. They are here together with some of our Oxford students and it's very important for us to integrate students into the activities of the other logos because if students don't understand Europe, where will Europe go? And therefore I'm very, very delighted that um, the students are here from the European, from Oxford, and um, that we will have one and a half days for some, for most one day, but for some a bit longer discussions on these themes. As I said, this picture wouldn't have happened without Julie, Jess, and their team working very, very hard to make it happen. So Julie, for all your logistical support, for everything you do in making this conference um, the success that it will be. And every successful conference loses at least one speaker. We can, we can <laughs> say we have already done that. We lost our first one. So this is a real success. We have, we have proven we can do it. And that never destroys the spirit or the content and so on. So I'm very, very optimistic that we will have excellent panels. Again, I'm delighted that you're all here 
and I leave it to the panel chairs to introduce the individual subjects, the individual <coughs> panelists. You find it in Julie's program, but I leave it to my colleagues. So thank you, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Let me just echo, first of all, Hartmut Meyer uh, in, in welcoming all of you, um, and also add to his uh, points that um, this conference has been thought of, framed for months, really, in fact, more than months, for a long time, uh, by, Charles in, by Charles Enoch and Adrian here, and am I forgetting, in terms of the... Frame and, and all of their colleagues uh, who, are, who have been active in, for many years in our seminars and activities around the political economy of financial markets and the EU here. Um, so um, Charles and Adrian and friends, um, I don't want to steal the frame from you and indeed it is well described in your program here. But I think it's fair to say that we have three, we want, we want to keep in mind three kinds of concerns um, as we talk together all afternoon. The first is that it's an issue of the EU and membership. That, what does it mean to be in or out? In fact, we kind of know that usually there's something in between. You can be in almost out, out almost in. In this country, we know this very well. Now in the Euro, it's supposed to be more specific, black and white, but is it really? And in any case, what we care about here today, uh, what Charles has done a lot of work on is indeed, what does it mean to be out? And how do you move from out to in? Is it about being willing or is it about being able? And what determines whether you're willing or able? And this is where we have the two other dimensions. One is, well, it varies across domains, across issue areas. And indeed, in the conference today, we will start with banking because this is kind of, in a way, the crust of the disagreements these days. And then to move on, so two panels related to banks and then the euro more generally and macroprudential. So we move across interrelated issues that are all kind of overlapping circles, really. Um, but I, but I would say that the third point to, be in, to keep in mind is a more conceptual point, and it's a point that we will deal with across all of these four panels today. And that is that whether you are out or whether you're in in these various issue areas, all countries, like all individuals, try to find the right balance between two fundamental tropes. On one hand, cooperation, because we know we need this in a world of externalities where we have to learn to internalize externalities, and yet we can never do it somehow. But at the same time, the second trope is always control. Whether we're talking about individuals, like my daughter slamming the door of her bedroom when she doesn't want mom to, you know, as an adolescent, you always want to take back control, but is it only adolescent? So every human being wants to take back control, not only our dear prime minister. Um, and every country somehow cherishes, through its electorate and its politician, uh, the, at least the appearance of sovereignty and autonomy, if not the actual fact of it, because we know that's kind of almost impossible. So whether you're in or out of the euro, of the banking union, you, you are trying to strike this balance as a country. And in that sense, the ins and the outs face the same big challenge. Um, and so having said that, having posited this question, I now want to um, turn to the panelists for these first panels who will want to address it in relation to the banking union. Uh, what is the trade-off in being out? Is it better to have a seat on the table, that's what the EU is all about, or is it better to cherish more the control part and keep your autonomy? Or what mix of the two and how do you move from one to the other? Um, in order to address these questions and all the other ones they want to frame related to our panel, we have three wonderful panels and I want to simply um, um, signal to you that we, one of our panels, Mikhail Krista, couldn't be with us and also that we're going to run in a different order. Uh, we're going to start with Christian Popa, 
uh, from the National Bank uh, of Romania, former. Uh, and let me say here, uh, valid for my panel, but for all the other panels today, you have wonderful biographies prepared by Julie here, uh, put together. So we're not going to, to introduce the speakers. You can just refer to the bios. Um, and so we will start with Christian Popa, then we will move on to Patrick Amis, um, a, who is at the ECB, and we will uh, finish with our very own uh, Daniel Hardy, who has been a wonderful fellow at our European Center, formerly at the IMF, and who uh, will both say what he wants to say <laughs> from his experience, but also bounce back already from the two previous uh, presentation and open up and then we'll have a, a moment if we have time between us quite quickly and then turn to Q&A. Are we good? Here we go. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very and much, um, Calypso, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be uh, back here. I believe the last time I was here, although the format was different, it was the Political Economy of Financial Markets uh, a seminar. Um, that must have been six years ago. Uh, Max was still with us uh, at that time. Um, so it's a pleasure to reconnect and uh, come back into a loop which I have uh, in uh, the past few years observed from a distance. Um, there are several things to be said as speaking from a view the viewpoint of a uh, member state of the EU but not a Euro area member country in terms of banking union. Um, Please remember that the idea sort of came to fruition in the spring-summer of uh, 2012, and then the actual publications of the Commission, in a fairly sketchy way, were, were uh, forthcoming in September, if I'm not mistaken. At that point in time, um, we in the Central Bank, and then more broadly, uh, together with the government and the presidency of Romania, uh, decided to look very closely at the possibility of close cooperation down the line for a variety of reasons, and they do apply, to my mind, to other countries uh, in a similar situation to Romania, two of whom are represented here uh, today, Bulgaria and Croatia. In the first instance, uh, we were talking about countries that had a fairly high degree of currency substitution, either directly related to the monetary policy regime they had in place, or in the case of Romania with the uh, manage float uh, because of, let's say, historical reasons, uh, perennial uh, uh, um, high to mid uh, rates of inflation uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. We also, in Romania, still have a, we are a host country, about 90% of banking sector capital comes from abroad and specifically from Eurozone member states. So it would make sense to us, instead of essentially having to hear about, uh, let's say, developments and possible measures adopted that impact on the uh, parent bank and the group from the leaders of that specific credit institution or organization, we would uh, instead uh, thought, we thought it would be much better if we had a seat at the table, number one, to have a chance to present things from the host country perspective, Secondly, to hear what is being discussed and to hear about the decisions uh, and uh, possibly try to shape them in accordance to, uh, to uh, Romania's, let's say, national interests uh, in a direct way rather than, than a circumvented way. The second thing was that uh, already we, after the uh, onset of the global financial crisis, we saw that the expected process of deleveraging uh, basically also to some extent happened with funding. At that time, Romania was heavily dependent on parent to, to uh, um, sub uh, lines of credit. This has changed in the meantime. And now uh, we, we are talking about loan to deposit ratios of about 70, 75 percent and locally raised uh, uh, deposits. But at that time, and because Vienna won, was uh, essentially about to take off in the spring of 2009 uh, and basically survived until 2011, Vienna to take, uh, took on from there, there was still an interest to basically be able to have a way that was different than arguing your case as a host country with your counterparts and peers from the home countries in terms of 
having an orderly, uh, uh, let's say, path of deleveraging for foreign owned banks. Um, there are, of course, several components to, to banking union. We're talking more about SSM at the time. It also happens that despite concentration and the almost 90% number that we mentioned, none of the banks as of today in Romania would be on the radar to be directly supervised by the ECB. The largest commercial bank at this point in time, if my numbers are correct, in Romania has something like 17 billion uh, equivalent of assets and therefore is short of the significant institution threshold. Now, you uh, will be you know, um, uh, undoubtedly aware of the fact that literature is beginning to show that in certain countries there is arbitraging around that limit in which you cross over from the domestic supervisor to the ECB uh, and uh, this does not necessarily uh, entail, let's say, positive aspects only, but in Romania we thought that this would be overall a good measure. Um, talks already started in an informal way with the ECB uh, in 2000, I believe, 13-14. There are ongoing and I will get into that in a second because obviously uh, explicitly since Bulgaria asked for uh, ERM2, uh, let's say, membership and banking union was seen as a condition of that, the game has shifted in the meantime. It's no longer just the call of the country before the moment of euro adoption to go or not go for close cooperation. The moment that you do want to adopt the euro and that the timetable is fairly uh, ambitious, uh, ERM2 basically depends on going into, into the close cooperation mechanism, having uh, uh, AQR and, and the whole, let's say, um, uh, baggage, if it's not too loaded a, a word, of things that need to happen before you can you can uh, get to uh, cooperating with uh, with uh, the banking union uh, pillars. Can I just ask yes. when <clears throat> the first time you use an acronym for maybe the few people oh, in just, the room just spell it out. who might not know the acronym? S just SSM was single supervisory mechanism. I'm sorry. And AQR. Um, exactly. Asset quality review. It's measuring the quality of a portfolio of banking institutions, if not the entire country. And uh, obviously, stress tests feature heavily uh, in that to measure the quality of balance sheets and the health of individual institutions of the entire banking sector uh, and the financial sector in that country that wants to bid for close cooperation or eventual membership of, uh, of uh, banking union, of SSM. In terms of the single resolution mechanism, uh, SRM, um, a resolution department has been up and running at the Central Bank of Romania since 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we spoke about doing that, but it only uh, happened, happened uh, slightly later. Um, as, let's say, a new element in terms of the capital buffers that are um, um, involved, we basically have a um, um, conservation uh, a buffer and a systemic uh, risk buffer operating in the country at this point in time. Uh, the systemic risk buffer depends on the quality of balance sheets as related to both non-performing loan uh, shares and to the provision, the coverage by provisions of those non-performing loans. Romania was in a very uh, bad situation in terms of the headline numbers circa 2014 we were looking at 23% or thereabouts of balance sheets in terms of MPLs. These are now under 5% and they have been for a number of, uh, of uh, um, almost two years now. So there was a big uh, exercise to clean up balance sheets. I must, however, as a parenthesis to what I've said, point out that we don't hear about forbearance as much as we used to, but the definition of the, the, let's say, capacity for tolerance or lack thereof in countries was extremely varied. This was something we thought would be, die, die down as more countries uh, had a common perspective and as things became more comparable. Uh, in Romania, we prefer to take the hit of having higher numbers, but actually knowing how much dirt is hidden under the carpet rather than, than assuming things were, were good, also because provisions were, were quite firm. Let me uh, move away uh, from that. Uh, and we had people in the task force of the ECB working on the, let's say, uh, risk-free uh, uh, asset that may be put in place at some point in time. Um, 
And in terms of deposit guarantees, the game is still on there. It's, it looks like it may be getting a bit more steam, uh, given the, the, the German pronunciations <coughs> on this uh, from not that long ago. But uh, we have to see exactly what happens. Um, one thing I did not point out, and maybe I'll, I'll pause on that, uh, is that not everything is as straightforward as getting in touch with the ECB, doing a QR, doing stress tests. We're quite advanced in stress tests in Romania. With the help of the IMF, we were, um, I think, the first country in the region to do comprehensive liquidity stress tests together with the, let's say, more regular uh, aspects of that exercise. Um, but liquidity itself is an important aspect uh, of a non-euro area member country with currency substitution eventually participating in banking union. We know, let's say, informally from the ECB that they view liquidity issues as being solely a matter of monetary policy. My, uh, let's say, personal take on this is that they have a lot to do with financial stability and that in case you basically have severe threats to financial stability manifesting in a country, you may have a surge in deposit withdrawals in euros where the only recourse of the banks affected by those uh, is basically using collateral, accessing liquidity facilities in domestic currency, and then having the central bank swap those against reserves into forex. Now that, if the, the uh, deposit run is large, can basically draw down reserves very quickly, and that signals to markets that there's not only a banking crisis in the making, there may be a currency crisis. To my mind, the way out of this would be to establish a contingent swap line with the ECB in euros, triggered by a clear definition of what severe, let's say, threats to financial stability would mean and how they would manifest, because this is the institutional equivalent of whatever it takes for a country. I think that depositors, knowing that there will be the eventual backing of the ECB to provide liquidity in euros would basically not go and withdraw those deposits. In previous, let's say, deposit runs in Romania, even though those happened 20 years ago, we saw people going, withdrawing domestic currency and dollars, back then it was dollars, not euros, just to essentially create a new deposit and put money back in the bank again once they saw they could actually get it. So. Fighting a banking crisis, if it ever happens, is a matter of psychology and is a matter of very quick reaction and being nimble on your feet. That is why, obviously, I believe the central bank would still adhere to the policy it had back in the day to solvent institutions. We're on the same page as the ECB there. We will, they would be ready to provide liquidity as defined by the legislation against a variety of collateral broader than the one for open market operations or for overnight Lombard, let's say liquidity provision, but um, they would be hesitant to massively use swaps into Forex if reserves were to decline very abruptly, very fast. That's why that kind of backstop would be useful. I am not aware of any progress having been made in the meantime on this, uh, but again, the discussions were informal. And uh, um, uh, let me now just say two words before I stop because I think I'm exhausting my, my patience. In the no, meantime, I'm patient. <laughs> <laughs> well, my minute. welcome. Sorry, I, I did I did misspeak. Uh, in the meantime, Romania has basically reiterated its wish to be part when it is ready, which also means the the um, uh, pursuit of structural reform and uh, more real convergence uh, with the euro area to be a part of the Eurozone. That also means that banking union, as part and parcel of that preparatory process, it seems, from the Bulgarian, let's say, experience recently, uh, will have to happen, irrespective of the desire for close cooperation expressed a number of years ago. That also has a political dimension. It will be explored, I think, in the second panel, so I don't want to go into too much detail uh, there. But the intention of the Romanian authorities uh, in power in government up until recently was for Euro adoption to happen in 2024. Given the fact that the revision of the fiscal deficit for this year has uh, overshot 
and that uh, the deficit will be consolidated gradually, I think that 2024 may be a difficult target to reach, and therefore the country should prepare thoroughly, including for banking union, uh, also as an anchor for things happening at home, because if you just move the target further, nobody in the body politic will want to actually do anything uh, about it in case tough reforms also mean a loss of voter support. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Christian, because you've touched on every single issue that concerns us in this panel. And indeed, um, with a number of hooks uh, regarding the ECB, whether it's talking about risk assessment and whether um, there's agreement there, but also your, uh, your veiled questions, I would say, on contingent swap line with the ECB. What happens in the case of a crisis? What is the ECB ready to do? Is it consistent with the past, or are there going to be changed in direction, <coughs> the change in leadership, etc.? And whatever other questions you want to address, Patrick. But I think you already have, with Christian, some issues that you might want to respond to. Okay, thank you. So many thanks. Um, many thanks. Um, uh, delighted to be here. Many thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's a very interesting uh, topic that it uh, has the, the heart of my preoccupations right now because in the ECB I'm uh, in charge of the so-called and I'm going to use probably a lot of acronyms and I'll try to explain them <laughs> as I go. I'm in charge of what the so-called LSI oversight. So the LSI are the less significant institutions in our jargon. It's a very bad name that uh, stems from the regulation. We cannot change it, uh, sadly. So these are the banks that in the banking union are not supervised directly by the ECB, but remain supervised by the national competent authorities, the NCAs, as we call them, uh, uh, once we are in the banking union or close cooperation. And uh, uh, there is a variety of rules for deciding what is an SI, a significant institution supervised directly by the ECB, or an LSI, I think in a nutshell, uh, if uh, for any particular country you are one of the three biggest banks in the country, you are an SI, if your total assets are above 30 billion, you are an SI. And all the rest is LSI. Uh, so you have uh, currently 119 SIs and something like 2,400 LSIs in the system. Um, so being in charge of LSI oversight, because the, uh, once you, we have uh, made that distinction, the ECB remains interested in the entire system. So we also look at and, uh, what is happening in supervision for the LSI, so how basically the national competent authorities discharge their supervisory responsibilities. And this is what I do, uh, basically. So I'm uh, in dialogue, in constant dialogue with our uh, colleagues in national competence authorities and trying to understand how they, they, they do the job in terms of banking supervision for the LSIs. Um, and beside this, I'm also in charge of what we call the close cooperation uh, process that uh, you alluded to, you mentioned very, very much in, in detail already. Uh, which is the process where uh, uh, any uh, particular country that is not uh, a member of the Eurozone, uh, if you're a member of your, the Eurozone, you are automatically uh, within the single supervisory mechanism. And if you are not a member of the Eurozone and a member of the EU, you can decide to apply for close cooperation, in which case uh, I deal with the, the, the supervisory side of that, uh, of those requests. And uh, uh, we have currently uh, two requests uh, ongoing. Uh, uh, we started with uh, Bulgaria and we have Croatia uh, as has uh, uh, joined the lot. And we are currently very busy uh, um, uh, with our colleagues in, in uh, both Bulgaria and Croatia assessing uh, the entry into close cooperation. So. Um, so I look at that from a very operational perspective, but it's good to, to sit, sit back and think a little bit about what we're doing, basically, from time to time. And I think, essentially, if I look at that in the broader uh, scheme, um, I think uh, the banking union and, and, uh, and the, the, uh, the euro uh, area, in, in particular, um, yeah, is essentially going further than the EU 
uh, and uh, basically trying to, to, to do two things. You, you sort of trade uh, uh, your ability to ring fence to dash any bank in whatever way you want to uh, for a little bit of stability and security in, uh, in capital flows uh, uh, within the system and uh, hopefully uh, having a, what we, we uh, just call the say at the table uh, in the supervision of the larger banking groups. And I think to, to, so that already tells us that one of the big drivers to decide whether you want to join the, the banking union or not are indeed uh, uh, to be found in the degree of economic and banking integration you are being faced with. And I think uh, the both are important in terms of economic integration. We know that we have uh, a, a huge deal of economic integration within the, the countries uh, in the EU. Uh, it's, it's even truer in uh, within the Eurozone, of course. Uh, so that uh, is a powerful driver. The, the, the second powerful driver is the extent of banking integration. And when I look at the countries that are uh, within the EU and outside of the Eurozone, uh, uh, and by the way, you know that two of those countries that are outside of the Eurozone and within the EU, two of them have a permanent exemption from joining the Euro. Uh, one of them is in the process of getting a permanent leave, by the way, from the EU, <laughs> as you know very well. Um, uh, and the other one, which is Denmark, has uh, formally a permanent exemption to join the, uh, the Euro. Um, the other ones are supposed to join over time, and, uh, and it's a timeline that is not set, but over time the Euro, and therefore the SSM. Um, so in terms of banking integration, I think when, when I look at the picture, you have essentially um, uh, uh, two different situations. You have uh, the um, uh, Eastern and uh, Southern European countries that are not members of the SSM that have a lot of foreign banking presence in their geographies and coming uh, in, in the vast majority from SSM banks. And of course for them, I could immediately see that there is an interest in understanding what those banks are doing, not only in their geography, but also at group level, because what matters in that kind of situation, if in case of crisis, uh, you have essentially two partners, which are traditionally a home and a host supervisory authority. So, uh, and you know that's a little bit of a prisoner's dilemma. So the the host is uh, is of course uh, uh, scared that the home will uh, force the bank to abandon his operations and leaving the bill to the to the country. And um, the home is scared that everything that is in terms of capital and equality in the host country cannot circulate to help other parts of the group, therefore might uh, uh, increase uh, problems at uh, group level if uh, there is one. So there is always that trade-off that we see in a home-host relationships and banking supervision, and we try to uh, circumvent by uh, deepening the, uh, the banking supervision and that mirrors to, to a very large extent the, the, the further integration of the banking uh, market. And then you have the second category of countries are uh, Northern European countries, uh, uh, Sweden, Denmark in particular, where uh, I if you look at the, the, the total balance sheets of the largest, largest banks in uh, these countries, uh, a very sizable part of their operations are deployed in the uh, SSM area in the Eurozone. So, of course, for them, it becomes also uh, at least a question uh, mark whether they want to have a seat at the table to better understand how the SSM is doing banking supervision and is making decisions with respect to their subsidiaries and uh, that have a very sizable uh, uh, impact on the total uh, operations of the bank of their banking group. So, this is in a nutshell where we stand in terms of, of uh, dynamics, I think. Um, so uh, what does it mean once you decide that the, the benefits uh, of, of uh, and the, the given the, the amount of integration you're having, once you decide that the benefits are bigger than uh, the potential drawbacks and that the potential drawbacks being essentially uh, departing yourself from uh, a piece of sovereignty. Uh, uh, 
question is, uh, to echo your point, question is it real sovereignty? So can you really, so to which extent are you able to really make your own decisions independently of what the others are doing? Or is it better to join the club and have a bigger influence on the overall decision making? I think once you have made that determination, it's better to join. What does it mean having a seat at a table? I think it's essentially um, it's essentially four four elements. Uh, of course, having a seat at the table is first and foremost being part of the decision making. So, uh, uh, the way we make decisions um, in uh, in the, the ECB in terms of banking supervision is a twofold process. We have what we call a supervisory board. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, the board composed of a number of uh, uh, ECB representatives and uh, otherwise the, the heads of banking supervision in each of the different member states participating in the SSM. And once you are um, at the table, you will have a seat in the supervisory board and you can uh, discuss, uh, influence, vote uh, on the different decisions. Uh, and once those discussions are being and, and votes are being made by the supervisory board, the supervisory board ends up with a, a so-called draft decision, and this draft decision goes to the governing council um, for non-objection procedure. So what does it mean? It means that the governing council can only agree or refuse uh, to a draft decision coming from the supervisory board. It cannot modify it. And it's very important to have this in mind because one, of course, of the things we very often hear in the, in the, in the trade-off of do I want to join close cooperation or not, if I am not a Euros member, is uh, if I join, I will indeed have a seat at the supervisory board table, but I will not have a seat at the governing council table. So uh, I am at a disadvantage here. Uh, so first, we have some safeguards that are built in our regulation. I will not dwell on that, but I think you have some <coughs> safeguards to address uh, the, this legitimate concern. And second, I think the, the, where the action really is in that game is at the level of the supervised people. So that's the first element. The second element of, of what it means to, be, uh, to have a seat at the table is that you have members in the, the so-called GST. It's another recording. So what is a GST? It's a joint <laughs> supervisory team. A joint supervisory team is no more than uh, the group of national uh, banking supervisors together with an ECB team in charge of supervising uh, a group that is under a banking group that is under direct supervision by the ECB. So, taking an example, if I am in charge of supervising, let's say, Unicredit, uh, Italian banking group, the GST of Unicredit is composed of an ECB team, a team in Banca d'Italia, and a team in each of, uh, from coming from each of uh, the countries where Unicredit has. A subsidiary. So you will have a team uh, in the case of Unicredit, you will have a team of uh, uh, coming from people coming from Germany, Austria, and so on and so forth, and depending on the, uh, on the, the reach of this bank. And all of these teams share information and work together. And uh, I have been a, a national supervisor before joining the ECB. Uh, I have been part of the so-called colleges of supervisors where the colleges are sitting at the table and are supposed to exchange information genuinely about the uh, interaction with their banks. Uh, and I can assure you that being a, a member of the GST is a completely, totally different ball game. Uh, everyone has access to all information concerning uh, any banking group to start with. So it, I don't have, as a, as a host supervisor, I do not only have access to uh, the information from uh, my subsidiary, so to speak, but I have full access to the entire information concerning the banking group as well. So I am totally, 100% informed about what is happening at total group level, if I am in Austria, I want to understand what's happening in Italy, I can, uh, I can be there, um, uh, I can look into the files, I have direct access to that. Um, I will be part of the decision-making internal discussions within the GST um, to decide how do we allocate our resources, what is our work program, what are we concerned about, what do we care about, etc. And that is extremely powerful in terms of joining teams together. 
One thing we have been very busy at in the first years of existence of the SSM was to try and uh, 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 push the, the GST members to get out of their uh, national <coughs> remits to go a little bit into cross-border or cross-cutting themes and activities for the supervision of a group. So, of course, when you join from, uh, from Germany to supervise Unicredit, at the beginning of the SSM, your number one objective was to get better insight on the situation in Unicredit to make sure that you are still ring fencing properly the subsidiary in Germany. Uh, I think five years later, uh, we are in a very different ball game. We are in a situation where you will have um, a team composed of a German and Italian member looking at the Austrian portfolio of Unicredit. And this is what we try to achieve. The third, I have, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm moving on. The third um, element is uh, that we put together common methodologies and benchmarking. So common methodologies, it doesn't mean necessarily that they are better. You may have better things on your own, but they have the benefit of being common and they have the benefit of allowing you to benchmark. So usually when you are at a national level, you have just a few banks to compose. You join a club with full information when you can compare across the board and get common methodologies. Uh, the fourth element is, um, is of course, policy making. Uh, and uh, I think we have a stronger voice around a number of international tables when we come together and we have a say and we have an opinion on policy making for banking structure. So this is the four elements where I think it has value to, and this is what I think we mean by having a seat at the table. Um, just to finalize, um, on a bit what we do because I think Christian mentioned the, the AQR, etc. So what does it mean when you want to enter close cooperation? Close cooperation is a process where you have to satisfy essentially two conditions from the banking supervision perspective. One is uh, the banks you are sending into the system are considered safe enough that we will not have to spend public money or money from the sovereign uh, fund or SRF or whatever and into, uh, into uh, uh, dealing with, uh, with banking problems. So uh, for this you do a comprehensive assessment, so-called comprehensive assessment. A comprehensive assessment is made in terms of two elements, an asset quality review, AQR, and a stress test. And uh, out of that, some banks may end up with a need for more capital before the country can effectively enter into close cooperation. The second element is that you need to have your legislation properly uh, uh, put in place so that in close cooperation, uh, the decisions of the SSM uh, and of the ECB can be translated seamlessly into actual uh, implementation into the country with the ability to enforce those decisions effectively. So you have to modify your national legislation to allow for that. So this is the main two elements we have for that. And once you have that from the perspective of the banking supervision, uh, we are set. Right. Well, Patrick, I think that was a very comprehensive uh, set of criteria and uh, landscape. Uh, I, I, we had heard that Christian need, did need convincing of the four reasons why you might want to have a seat at the table but it'll be interesting to come back to you on the fulfillment of the conditions and where, whether you're all both on totally on the same wavelength about this. Uh, and indeed, perhaps Christian will want to kind of come back to issues of what happens uh, if there's a crisis. But in the meanwhile, uh, I'm turning to yeah. Daniel, who is going to wrap it all up for yeah. us uh, and, uh, and throw back the ball. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, Thank you to the two speakers also for providing you with some of the numerous acronyms that uh, make dealing with European issues so challenging. Uh, my main thesis I'd like to suggest to you is that for most countries, joining the banking union would not make an enormous difference to day-to-day -day banking supervision in terms of effectiveness. The really crucial issue is how it affects uh, dealing with a banking crisis, preparedness for a crisis, how you deal with it, and the macro-financial effects of such a crisis. So really, it's not only the, the, the single supervisory mechanism 
is one element. I think it was more crucial in this decision is how you imagine your country is going to function as part of the single resolution mechanism. So starting with supervision, one needs to remember that main supervision is actually quite constrained as it is. The directives and regulations provided by the Commission largely for many areas. Uh, the European Banking Authority provides extensive guidance on implementation and, and will keep you up to the mark to some extent. As mentioned also the international standards, which we try to obey by. If you have uh, mainly branches and subsidiaries in your banking system, they, their behavior will largely be dictated by their parents. I mean, to many countries where the bankers say, supervision here is, doesn't matter to us because our parents tell us what to do, and that's what we have to do, and it's tougher than what the national authorities do. And furthermore, um, the, you have the ESRB to uh, provide you with direction on the, um, on the macro potential side. Furthermore, even within the banking union, there's considerable national discretion. Uh, the national competencies, whole areas of vision <coughs> which belong to the national authorities, and the discretion within the law, so you can tweak your regulations a bit from side to side. Plus, you have the LSIs, the less, less significant institutions, which in many countries, well, not many, it's a few countries, notably Germany, Austria, and maybe Italy, make up a large share of the banking system. Uh, so, you know, these are quite constrained. Um, so next is, what are the disadvantages of joining the, the banking union, or at least being in close cooperation? Well, one element probably is that decision-making in the euro area institutions is pretty tedious. Even the people involved agree it's cumbersome and convoluted and very simple. Now, apparently the Europeans are good at managing complicated decision-making procedures. Things haven't gone too badly wrong. But I agree, this is a lot of effort. Um, I think another potential disadvantage is if you want to uh, closely link your prudential supervision, that is keeping the banks stable, with other elements of regulation supervision, such as consumer protection, market conduct, um, and also supervision of the non-bank financial institutions. So some countries prefer what's called a single peak approach, where it's all together in one institution, um, so the conduct and the prudential together. But the, the way the single supervisory mechanism is, is focused is focused on stability and prudential supervision. That's okay. And then there's issue about, you know, you're less able to set your own supervisory priorities if you're in this uh, team together. Um, perhaps to some extent, uh, again, I'm not sure that's such a, such a big deal. Many of the priorities seem to be rather similar. It's, it's pretty obvious everybody what the priority should be. And furthermore, there's a, there's, you don't want to join the banking union if you want to have light touch supervision. The, 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 the Euro system, the, the, the banking union, has turned to be pretty tough supervisors, precisely for some of the reasons mentioned, that they compare across the continent, and it's generally accepted they're, they're doing a pretty good job at this. So if you want to, like, be nice to your banks, you probably don't want to join the banking union. But there are advantages. Um, an important one for many smaller countries, you gain resources and information, as mentioned, just the, the, the people capable people you get helping you out from the other countries and from the centre is significant. There's less regulatory burden. That is to say, the banks themselves find being in the banking union a good thing because, the cross-border groups, because they have one set of regulations, basically one regulator to go to, the forms more harmonised. The banks don't like dealing with many different national regulators. And we saw this in a way with, in Scandinavia also, um, that, as I mentioned also, that Scandinavian banks would prefer to be in the banking union, they would find it easier to be one regulator. Um, and therefore, related to that, there's less chance of your own banking system becoming just branches of some parents somewhere, where you have even less control over them. And perhaps the single most important reason to join the banking union in many cases is to get less regulatory capture. Your banks in your society, in your economy, tend to have a lot of political weight, whereas if they're supervised largely from Frankfurt or Lebt, the, the Labour of Frankfurt, they have much less capacity to influence and twist arms and uh, say the right words and make persuasive things. That was certainly one of the reasons for founding the banking union. But I don't think any of these arguments in either direction are that major, in fact, compared to considerations of how things would work in time of crisis. There, too, there are cons severe constraints. Uh, within Europe, there's the Banking Recovery and, and Resolution Directive, which sets the framework for dealing with problem banks, which you have to translate into national law. You also need to deal with 
EU competition law, DG Comp, as it's known in the jargon. This is one of the most powerful parts of the Commission. It's one of their strongest mandates, and they will have a say in anything you want to do with the problem bank in a big way. Um, and then furthermore, you also, the reality is if you have subs and branches in your country, you're already in some resolution college, you're to deal with your colleagues elsewhere. You can't just do anything in banking resolution either. If you were involved in a single resolution mechanism, uh, you then need to accept that the banking supervisors will take action like, such as requiring additional capital for bank gets into trouble, what in America called prompt corrective action or early remedial action. And also they make a decision where the bank's really in severe trouble, so-called failing or likely to fail decision, which then triggers all this other stuff happening. <coughs> and what that happens, this other institution, I don't think mentioned yet, the single resolution board is it gets involved, they look at the resolution plans, they decide whether the institution is to be resolved or somehow wound up some other way. Uh, then you start getting involved with various funds. It has own fund. Um, there's a backup to that. Eventually, there may be European deposit insurance. Um, again, it's, again, a complicated process where, furthermore, the Commission's involved, the DG Comp is involved, and others. Um, but that's the way that works there. So, indeed, one of the disadvantages of being involved in the single resolution mechanism is that, again, we're not sure how it's going to work in practice. There's only been one instance actually which has been used, and that was a rather special case. The thing could just grind, the, 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 the gears just grind to a halt when you need to act quickly. Um, you also lose autonomy relating to the decisions of early remedial action and deciding when to intervene at all. Uh, your local knowledge is not being used the same way, in your local interests. Uh, you also have the complication that the significant institutions and the less significant institutions are under different regimes. So the, the big ones that's going to be involved through this European mechanism, perhaps, the little ones you still have to deal with yourself. Um, there's, a, there's a cost. You need to contribute to these, to these backup funds and eventually the European deposit insurance, so that's paid by banks. Um, and, uh, you know, this was mentioned here briefly. If you're in the mechanism, you'll be less able to accumulate capital and liquidity in your subsidiaries to be able to ring fence them in times of need. So that option is at least reduced if you're actually in the, in the, in the mechanism together. Again, it's not a very um, sort of being a good citizen to do this, but you have an interest perhaps. The advantages are, you say you get a seat at the table, or in this case, the many tables involved making uh, resolution decisions. Um, I think, again, the reduced regulatory captures can be very significant. We see in many cases of problem banks that special interests get bailed out. It's not necessarily the national interest, but the ones with the right influence get special treatment, and there's probably less if it's done on a European level. <coughs> there's risk sharing. This comes back to um, attenuating what's called the bank sovereign nexus. You're less likely to bankrupt the sovereign in order to bail out the banks or, 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 or some of the creditors which is what, you know, the, the core of the, of, the, of the sovereign crisis in Europe of the last decade. So this can be very significant in many cases. And then in that connection, you can even Europeanize a bank. So if you have a problem bank, you can suddenly say, we won't deal with this anymore. SRB, you deal with it. You can actually do this. You can voluntarily push banks up to the European level to get, get them off your hands, which I think is kind of a, uh, which has actually been done in some cases. So in balance, I think that there, again, you know, these are large amounts of money, politically very difficult. Um, when things go wrong, people are fired and, you know, careers ruined and country takes ages to recover and the big political consequences. So this is a much more intense um, issue than day-to-day -day supervision. If I were, so that on the basis of this, I'd say that there's roughly two, um, two camps. I mean, I think the banking union looks advantageous, or at least close cooperation. One if you have overwhelmingly branches or subs of banking union banks already. Again, this is a seat at the table. You can't just, if you're not part of it, you're just going to have to accept whatever's given to you. So you might as well join the club and, 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 and get, to, get, to, get to sit there. And the other, the banking union is particularly advantageous. If you have a lot of local banks that are potentially problematic and we think this bank sovereign nexus is quite threatening. If you think your banks are going to, be, going to cause a lot of trouble, Maybe a good idea to share the risks with your dear European neighbours. And it's less advantageous, I'd say, and uh, for the following cases. One is 
if you have lots of major national banks, not subs of foreigners, that are not problematic and where you don't think they're going to be that connected to the sovereign balance sheet. Then, you know, as your own guy, you want to look after them. You know best. Why bother with these complications in Frankfurt and Brussels? Um, there's also an argument for not being the banking union or not cooperating closely. If you have lots of non-EU banks, there's some countries where there may be significant presence from banks from the uh, States or Turkey or something like that. And it's less obvious what you're going to get out of joining this club that way. The third possibility is that you think that we're not joining the banking union is you think the single resolution mechanism is catastrophically flawed. You think it's going to fail, you think it's going to be terribly wrong, and some people think that, then you better not get yourself into that situation. Just, you know, build your own lifeboat, just, just not get yourself involved. So therefore I think that the situation differs for different countries, and the crucial issue is how you think, you, what, where you're better off in, in, in case of crisis. So in, um, uh, I, it, it's not perhaps that much contradiction to what's said by the others, but I would um, uh, um, like to suggest also to, 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 to particularly Christian, what, why didn't Romania just join from the beginning? What were they, what did they get out of it? Why, why, why didn't they be in close cooperation from the start? Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that was a really nice balancing uh, <laughs> bo in both areas. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and, and a direct uh, question to Christian, but Christian, you might also want to react to Patrick's response to you. The, let's say yes. Um, no, I, thank you very much for, for that to, to mm -hmm. both, uh, both speakers. Um, let me start with Daniel. Um, I did mention that mm. I think the opinion in Romania mm. has not changed since mm. I was still in the central bank. So for the past five years that Romania, through the central bank, mm -hmm. is in favor of mm -hmm. close cooperation. Um, there's another reason I did not mention when I spoke about this. Not only is Romania a small open economy, part of the EU but not of the euro area, mm -hmm. which basically has a lot of subs yeah. from the euro area, so it's mm. interested in, in sitting at the same table yeah. as the supervisors of the, um, the significant institutions. Mm -hmm. um, it could be the case, not necessarily in Romania, that some of the, the systemically important institutions in the host country are not necessarily systemically important even as a group for the euro area and its supervision either at the ECB level or within mm. the member states. So that still I would think come, would come as an argument for being present, making mm -hmm. your case heard. We have, prior to the uh, global financial crisis, had a situation where in the run-up, the name of the game was uh, market share competition between mm -hmm. foreign and banks, with a lot mm -hmm. of forex credit being, uh, mm -hmm. being uh, granted, which was not something you could control through demand management by raising interest rates, because through appreciation, you would just stimulate more of that mm -hmm. lending to happen. And when we tried a variety of macro pro measures, I will be speaking about those in mm -hmm. the last panel, uh, we saw that there was a limit for those as well. After a certain point, mm -hmm. the subs would basically sell portfolio mm -hmm. by cherry picking to the parents, getting more liquidity, lending that in turn very, mm -hmm. very uh, fast. So we went to, I will not mention the country, but to the home country, let's say, supervisors, and we said, guys, this is, there's only so much we can do through moral suasion, through macro crew. You need to help us mm -hmm. out by talking with the parent banks and getting us uh, some, some leeway that way. And they said, look what happened to Italy when they got involved in a banking decision. We don't want to touch this. It's not our thing. So we were not doing light touch mm -hmm. supervision. Mm -hmm. Supervision has been constant and fairly tough in Romania. Hence, let's say one metric would be the fact that solvency is mainly tier one, mm -hmm. and it's about 19% right now, which is yeah. considerably higher than in many other countries. And it's not that different in terms of the, uh, let's say, peer group uh, countries. But uh, other countries before uh, uh, GFC were actually in the business of lighter touch supervision. I think that banking union participation has changed this, and a seat there would give a voice both to a host country and to one that may have financial stability, let's say, problems mm -hmm. uh, from less significant institutions, 
Financial stability, as we know, is a, ma is a major concern for the European Union as a whole. And I think that in that light, participation would be warranted. There is a second dimension to Romania wanting to be there, which is the fact that, bizarrely enough, we have seen a decrease uh, relative to GDP of the stock of non-government lending from mm -hmm. domestic sources. It's now the lowest in the Union, it's about 25%. If you look at Romania's growth rates, there is no way that 25% lending and just retained earnings can fuel growth of 7% three years ago and about 4 to 4.5% 4 at the end of last year. So we know that there is a lot of cross-border credit activity going especially along su supply channels, supply chains, from, uh, let's say, uh, um, parent to, to a local company within, within uh, uh, non-financial groups. And from major banks to well-reputed large multinational corporations operating in Romania and in the region. And we have little information about that. We have what you can recover from, let's say, a balance of payment statistics and BIS. Mm -hmm. I think that we would have more clarity on what is going on, including from this, by participating. Now, why that hasn't uh, as yet happened? I think the political dimension of joining the euro has basically been more apparent when I basically said that the 2024 target was looking uh, more difficult to attain. I'm not trying to make any kind of uh, verdict happen here. Uh, this is political and the central bank, I believe correctly said, we can deal with a technical part. We will have a large role to play, but it's not our call. There needs to be a consensus, including from the body politic, from parliament, from government, from, uh, from the presidency, that the country needs to do this in that time frame. The central bank, again, has raised the fact that if we are to benefit as a country from joining the euro, a lot of structural transformation need, needs to still happen. You cannot just wish yourself into the euro. First of all, it's not your call. ERM2 used to be the one thing you could decide by yourself. That's not the case anymore. You need to do a number of things to get there. And it's interesting to see that one country that I think wanted close cooperation, but to my mind is not there yet, Denmark, was a signatory of the letter sent to the Bulgarian administration in 2018 about the need to do different things, including uh, close cooperation uh, in terms of, the, of, of SSM, before they could actually be allowed into uh, ERM2 and to qualify for that. So that's quite interesting. I am basically putting forth the idea that you need to look at the political dimension, complicated and messy, and not dependent on, on central bank actions alone, as it is to understand the whole picture. Mm -hmm. uh, m to my mm -hmm. mind, nothing has changed in terms of Romania's desire to ultimately get close cooperation. And so to Patrick, is it, it's not your call, but a bit your call, <laughs> to what extent? And also, perhaps reacting very quickly to Daniel's kind of provocation, doesn't make much difference in supervision, but important for resolution. Do you agree with that distinction yeah, uh, strongly? Yeah, maybe just to, to, to Christian, I think yeah, I fully agree. I think it, at the end of the day, it's a political decision as well. Uh, from uh, it is true that we have seen that uh, uh, a number of countries that were willing to join ERM2 have been advised to uh, apply for close cooperation as well. So uh, uh, have uh, happily applied for close cooperation in, in the same time, but. I think uh, so. The close cooperation uh, element, which was first conceived as a kind of technical element to allow for an entry point into the SSM, sort of a bit distantiated from the discussion on ERM2, is now a little bit more drawing with this. And when you think about it from a political perspective, you could think it makes some sort of sense. But it's uh, it's from 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 my perspective as a practitioner. Uh, I'm dealing only, of course, about the, the close cooperation element, and, but we, we, of course, link it to uh, to uh, ERM2, etc. Um, maybe for, to to uh, to Daniel, I think uh, um, yeah, there is one thing that uh, you mentioned, Daniel. I would tend to subscribe to is that if you want to have a light touch supervision, don't join the SSM. <laughs> I, mean, I, I would certainly subscribe to it. Um, uh, whether it does not make a difference, I would let me qualify that. I think, uh, again, I, before joining the ECB, I came from a, from a national banking supervisor. And 
I thought indeed that it's pretty simple. We have uh, regulation, we have directives, we have EBA, we have guidelines, we have a number of things, comply or explain, more or less binding. So it should be a little bit straightforward. And you get into the game and you start talking to your colleagues and all coming from other countries and you say, well, wait a minute, how do you apply that exactly? So you understand very quickly that we, we started that game from basically 19 vastly different supervisory traditions. One uh, does uh, put a little bit more emphasis on uh, on-site inspection, uh, the other uh, is a little bit more PowerPoint supervision type, you have, I mean, you put emphasis on capital or liquidity or uh, it was massively different in cultures and in applications. And it took us quite a lot of time in the beginning to try and get to something that is common. And uh, that echoes um, uh, uh, one of your points, Daniel, that is complexity. Uh, and yes, there is complexity. I think there is two elements of complexity if you think about it in, in substance. The first one is, is decision making. Uh, and let's be clear about that. Complexity in, in decision making is, is just the reflection of member states deciding at some point to say, okay, we go for the SSM, but wait a minute, I still want to have as much as possible national say on it. So you get inevitably to a little bit of a complex decision making process. Uh, that being said, I think we have had several crises already and we have proven that we can act in an emergency. And so we, we can act over the weekend as well. Um, but that element of complexity is and will stay for a pretty uh, long period of time. The second element of, com of complexity is our own processes, procedures, right? and that is something that if you, if you look at that again, a little bit from, from the, 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 the back seat, um, Banks do complain about that, a and to some extent rightly so. Uh, but think about it. You start with 19 totally different cultures, applications. How do you manage to get that app up and running in a, in a smaller amount of time possible? You do this by heavily processing everything you do. Uh, I think we have uh, gone through that phase, I think we are now more than five years into SSM, it is probably, I think we could argue, and we agree to a large extent, it is probably time to start thinking uh, for ourselves and ask ourselves, do we have the ability to reduce a little bit that element of complexity, give a bit more room for judgment now that we have a bit more supervisory <coughs> culture, integrated supervisory culture. That this is, I think, the next phase of the SSM in the next five years, basically. Right. Daniel, is it okay if we open up? And, or did you want to that, that, I, mean, I think that yeah. I, I was intentionally being a bit provocative, but, but, but my impression is, well, first of all, if, if you're a country and you want to have good, tough supervision, you can do it outside the single supervision. And, and the net effect is your banks will be fairly solid. But both the, both the people who join and the people who don't join, the big concern is what happens when something goes wrong? And is this going to work right or not? Yeah. I mean, you know. yeah, some and I, I think that yeah. a lot of countries post-crisis were improving supervision. But, you know, yeah. that's the big... No, I think maybe on the crisis mm -hmm. element, just, and just to finalize yeah. on, the, yeah. on the good supervision stuff, yeah. I think there is one thing, uh, just to mention a little mm -hmm. bit, I think, one thing I have observed in a number of cases, I don't want to make a general rule of that, but I think you mentioned it yourself, but uh, the SSM is slightly more remote from uh, local politics. And sometimes it may play a role. Uh, just to, to mention en passant. Yeah. Uh, on, on the crisis element, I think crisis management element is a, is a fundamental element, of course, and you know that um, this is, in, to my mind, and I think we have been very vocal in the ECB and the SSM to, to argue for that, uh, we at the open level did not do enough yet to complete the banking union in that respect. I think the, um, the, our, our sister uh, institution, the, the um, uh, single resolution board is in place and operating, um, but we still have 
a number of progress to, 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 to make on this topic. The, 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 the first element, of course, is undoubtedly um, that we do not have uh, a single um, uh, DGS, so Deposit Guarantee Scheme. And you could think, but well, fundamentally, who cares? Uh, if the other two elements are working, we probably do not need a single DGS. But you know, as a country, that if something happens, at the end of the day, the bill is for you. And that has that retroacts on the on the other uh, on the first two elements, and this is absolutely crucial in our view that we complete this element of the banking union. We know that there have been a number of attempts. This is probably slightly delayed. We hope that it will be revived. We continue to believe it's an important element in the discussion. The the um, the other element in the discussion is that. Uh, we are uh, in a system where you have either, uh, when you have the so-called public interest uh, decided by the resolution authority, either European or national, you are in a realm of resolution. Uh, if you do not meet the public interest test, what are you? You are in the realm of liquidation. So let's talk about liquidation. Uh, I am dealing with LSIs, I, and you know that in the one thing I forgot to mention is that the, even in the LSI environment, some of the key decision making elements for those banks are uh, ECB decisions. So the ECB has to make a decision on licensing, qualifying holding procedures, so when you acquire a bank, and on withdrawal of license. So I'm dealing with a number of questions with respect to withdrawal of license for LSIs together with the national competent authorities. And when you arrive at the, the, the stage of liquidation, you quickly discover that you have 19 different liquidation insolvency regimes in Europe. It's a total mess. Um, uh, in some, you have to go to a judge. In some, uh, so you can end up, depending on the country you're dealing with, you can end up with very different outcomes at the, the, at the time of liquidating a bank. That makes our life com jointly not easy. Uh, so I think this is something we will need also to, uh, to improve uh, over time. Indeed. So thank you very much mm -hmm. for a fascinating <coughs> set of uh, arguments and points. L let me take a packet of, of uh, questions and intervention and please say your name when you first speak. Yes. 